And over the 23 years, uh, one sort of ongoing discussion was always about research. Now, how much is research part of our business? How much does research belong? And I think there seem to be um, a lot of different, different perceptions about research. And I would like to um, say a few words about this, this kind of perception, not about research in practice so much, but about sort of the, the philosophy and the ideas of research um, and what role research actually could play in, in, in our language centers. Now, the reason why I dare to speak about this topic is my life, my academic life, my professional life, uh, in my professional life, I, I started off as, as a researcher. And I was a researcher for about, I don't know, um, 12 or 13 years, nothing to do, I mean, I taught linguistics, um, uh, theoretical linguistics, but um, I didn't know anything about teaching. So when I came to the language center, um, I had to start learning to teach. But I had a background, my background was actually in, in um, second language acquisition research, and I was one of the co-workers in one of the first uh, German projects on um, second, language, uh, second language acquisition. So that's my background, and since, since then, I've moved away from research. Uh, not too far away, because I, I, I'm still sort of acting as a, as a consultant, and as a scientific consultant in some, some projects, in some uh, very practical projects like, um, which I mentioned, for instance, one which I mentioned at the beginning um, of, of, of Volko on Thursday is, is early, early learning, which is not directly connected to the language center. But the kind of ideas that you get um, are um, also interesting and, and have something to do with lang language learning in general. So that's why I dare to speak about, uh, to speak about research in general. And the discussion usually centers around are we allowed to do research? I'm not addressing this question because I think some, there is a, also a, a wrong perception about research involved in this question. I mean, how, who on earth can allow me to do research? Um, usually people talk about when they mean are we allowed to do research, what they talk about is are we, do, do we get funding for research? Um, how can I sort of uh, basically organize my time so that I have time for research? But that's not the question I would like to, to address. Um, <laughs> research laboratory. And also, um, my, in my private life, because my, 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 um, my, my sister is a, is a toxicologist, and, and she's a researcher uh, as a toxicologist. And I usually, uh, when we talk, I, I usually compare sort of her outlook uh, on research. Um, and uh, we're very untypically, I mean, uh, as far as gender, gender, gender issues are concerned, uh, that, that my sister is a, is a scientist and, and uh, I'm more in the, in the humanities. Nevertheless, so we compare what, what is actually research in the sciences um, to what we mean uh, by research. Anyway, my question is, and everybody who talks about research has to answer that question, can a language center actually function without um, its own research? And I have a clear answer to that, yes, it can. Uh, with the second question, what does research actually mean in the context of language centers? Now when I say without its own research, I, there is a problem. And I see this, and I, I want to be a little bit provocative. What I see, yes, you probably can survive, and you can be a good and successful language center without your own research. But you have to look at research in order to be a good language center. And what I find more and more in language center is that people don't look at research. And sometimes even the, the, there's a tendency to frown upon what's going on in research. And when I mean research, I don't mean the tons of stuff on methodology, um, on um, what have you, on, on how to teach vocabulary and all that, um, which is rarely read by um, uh, by teachers actually in, 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 the, in their teaching practice, but a lot of other things that you buy in a package when you don't look at it. Give you an example, we talk a lot about autonomous learning, and some of the concepts of autonomous learning are based on theories, and if you buy those theories, fine, but if you don't know anything about those theories which are behind those things, uh, then you buy the whole package, and you end up with 
usually with a folk theory. Uh, I mean, that's true for, for, for a lot of, of, of ideas in, in pedagogy, that people end up with folk theories on how learning, I mean, ask people, we could do this, actually, I'm not going to do this, but what we could do is, is ask individually, how does learning actually, what is the process of learning and how does learning take place? How is language learning different from uh, learning other things? And there, there are millions of theories around, and most of those theories are folk theories. And what you usually get from your teachers is, oh, they don't know anything about it, but I know. Now, this is, this is where what we're dealing with, languages and language learning is very different from other academic subjects, where everybody, our customers, the people we teach, as well as our stakeholders, they all have a theory of learning. They don't have a theory of physics. They might not even have a theory of medicine, whatever. But with languages, they have no problem. They have millions of folk theories. And in order to demystify, if that's the word, those kind of folk theories, because you have to look at theories, and you have to look at, at research, and you have to continuously involve your um, your, uh, your staff in, in this particular reflection process. So your own experience against what we actually know and what the outcome of, of research in certain fields is. And when I, when I say research, and I'll come to that at the end, I don't only mean methodology, I don't only mean didactics. There, there are a lot of things and new ideas and new um, theories have come up which are important for um, for what we do. Now, it won't necessarily improve what we're doing, but it will help us reflect and um, gauge sort of the, the, the quality of, 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 our daily, uh, of our daily work. So, a clear no, uh, a yes, a clear yes, and uh, I think in the context of language centers, uh, I'll come to that. I think when you look at when people want, I want to do research, um, there are several reasons for that. And one of the reasons that is probably sometimes hidden in the agenda is we want to do research because we are an academic institution, or at least we are part of an academic institution. Um, we want to get recognition and appreciation within the institution. And the institution sees ourselves not as researchers, they see ourselves, they, they see us as teachers. Uh, they see us as service institutions, and research mm, doesn't belong there. And we think research belongs there because we are an academic institution. So the reason for research is usually one of the reasons, again, sometimes not, e not even spelled out openly, is we want to be integrated into academic culture, and therefore we need to do research. And that, that's interesting. There was an interesting development in Europe where um, colleagues started renaming language centers as institutes for communication and languages, or as departments for communication and languages. And that is actually bears witness to this kind of, um, this kind of development. This, the same thing I always ask in, in, in the German context, um, how do you tell your grandparents what your job is, right? And, uh, and very rarely would people say, in language centers, it could be different in yours, will say, I'm a teacher. What they want to be, and some, in, I mean, there are several words which you can use in German, in, in English, maybe you're a lecturer, and, and so on. And then the third, there's a third movement, which I find sometimes, where you get your colleagues trying to move closer to the faculties, or, or to the other institutes. Um, uh, slowly moving, sometimes we not, us not noticing it, uh, and all of a sudden they come up with a course which is on the forefront a language course, but in practice it's not a language course, it's something else they're starting to teach. So it's this, it, it's a, it basically boils down to the integration and research is part of that movement uh, towards integration. And I'm not against it. I think it is, there, is an, uh, there is motivation for, for looking into this uh, more, more, more closely. Now, this all has to do, and I have to do this uh, because, because Humboldt, <coughs> Wilhelm from Humboldt was a, a student at my university um, in, in the 19th century at the old, old Viadrina. And Wilhelm von Humboldt is, he is responsible, at least for the German university system, 
and he defined Wilhelm von Humboldt, and, and he's responsible for a lot of your systems too. Uh, maybe not for the British system, but definitely for, for, uh, for the systems in Central and Eastern Europe. And his idea was actually, the, it's a unity. It's a unity of research. That's, that's what defines a university. It's the unity of research, learning, and teaching. Right? So, and, and this is, this is this is where still Humboldt is the person with, there's a lot of discussion now with the Bologna process, uh, a lot of criticism, at least in the German context, that the university move away from, the, from Humboldt's idea and become more like a, 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 a vocational training school. Uh, but, but deep down in the academic culture, there's this, this, this idea of Humboldt ingrained. There's no university without research. There are basically, uh, all over the world, there are universities which don't do research, and they call themselves universities. But a German would not call those universities uh, universities because they don't, uh, as part of their remit, as part of their um, uh, business, they don't, have, they don't actually do research. Now, research, very important in an academic context, but I found this, this is actually from Australia, from a, a, a research project, an empirical research project um, in Australia, uh, and who measured, tried to measure the, the productivity in research ag uh, against the effectiveness uh, of the same department in teaching. And they come up with, the, with this kind of uh, hypothesis. It's uh, empirically proven. Uh, teaching effectiveness and research productivity are nearly uncorrelated, thus supporting the hypothesis that they are independent constructs, which goes back to my original um, uh, provocation uh, that they are res uh, they're very successful and good uh, language centers w without, without any research. Without, not not without, without conducting their own research, that's what I mean. Now, what is research? I was looking for a defi <coughs> definition, of course, it's, uh, it's um, what's it called, carrying calls to Newcastle, something like that. Uh, to talk to you about what is research, but I found a very interesting, uh, a, a very interesting definition by a guy who works, a, a Swedish uh, professor of, who, who founded his, his own discipline, um, and it's called um, paleogenetics, and he has his own institute uh, in Leipzig, and um, he, is the he was actually the first person to clone the DNA of an Egyptian mummy. Uh, his father is a Nobel Prize winner in uh, chemistry or something like that. And so, I mean, he's the person to talk to. And he was talking, uh, in, in, he wrote a book about the design of buildings for research. And, and this, the definition of research is, um, is, is from, from this particular, from, particular book. Now, the first point I find rather intriguing is that he defines research as a lifestyle. And he, he thinks that research is not only lifestyle, but it's part of your personality. And I think uh, I can, I would definitely underline this, that, that this is, I mean, it, it can actually even lead to a, um, a, a kind of professional disease where you question everything that's around you. I mean, your partner would probably tell you whether you have a researcher personality or not. Um, the second point is research is teamwork, and, and research is global teamwork. And what I sometimes find, I mean, I mean, I'm looking at research work at the moment because we have, we are, uh, we've been um, organizing a research prize within the, the uh, German, uh, German uh, uh, Association of, of University Language Centers, and I'm looking at research at the moment about 10 different types of research. And I find that the problem I have with that is that it's basically self-inspired. It is like you find your research question. I think a lot of those things happen in the humanities, right? And that's very different in the sciences. In the sciences, there is a debate, there's a question, and then you, as a student, as a PhD candidate and so on, you get your, uh, your question assigned. Sometimes you can't even choose that. So, the starting point in the sciences is usually a debate, a, a public debate, whereas um, in, in the humanities, and again, I try to be provocative, it's like, oh, mm, 
Um, I have a question. I mean, maybe that's an interesting question. I'll start with that. And then people go to their professors, as far as PhD is concerned, and say, yeah, well, I don't mind. Just write about it. And, and you sometimes wonder, where is the project? Where is the public debate on that? So you get tons of stuff on vocabulary learning. The question is, are you answering questions that nobody's asked? Um, research is competition. It's not, it's teamwork in one sense, but it's also competition. It's competing, competing theories. And you have that, but you sometimes ask where is the competing theory you're arguing for or against in the type of research we see in, in our journals. And of course, we will all um, actually um, sign that the essential conditions are a solid budget and the social structure are of the research team, of course, which is sometimes underestimated. And the last one I like particularly, um, hierarchies are absolutely counterproductive in research. Um, you could nail this to every German university. If you, um, he says, um, he goes as far as to say, well, Research is absolutely anti-authoritarian. Um, it is, uh, in this sense, uh, it, there's no one actually who could say, well, I'm the, I'm, I'm, I'm the head of research and I'm making the question. It, it is the, it's the debate that actually inspires research. Okay, so that's, my, um, that's the definition I like uh, as far as research is concerned. Now, when I looked at team, teamwork, global teams, and so on, um, I looked at websites to see what the academic background, and this is, this is one part of our problem, um, how the heterogeneity of the academic backgrounds of the people we work with, in some sense, of course, makes it difficult to address the same research question, to work with the same research methodology, and also to be familiar with the theories that you have to deal with when you design your own research, right? So this is, this is actually from, from Germany. Some, some people are very open about this and they put their whole CVs on, you know. Um, and these, these are, this is taken from CVs uh, from German, German uh, language centers, uh, from staff from German language centers. And I looked at the CVs and looked at the, um, the degrees, the final degrees of those people. And these are people te teaching different languages. Uh, these are people in, in language centers. So that makes, of course, you, if you look at this, we have people teaching uh, or sort of having a degree in Asian history, in law, in, uh, in a whole series of different philologies. In biology, you have people teaching languages who have a degree in biology, sociology, literary translation, historical linguistics, literary studies, environmental studies, European studies, education, political studies, history of art, media studies, journalism, language acquisition. They're more, they're, they're more, there was musicology and all that. I left that out. So that's the heterogeneity of our teams. Can you do research with those people? That's the question. How much are they familiar with the theories we have to deal with? And the theories go beyond, of course, the question of language methodology. They go beyond the questions of, of uh, language acquisition. Oops. Um, yes, are there reasons for research? And I think that there very clearly are. Um, that's, I think that's at the, the forefront of, 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 of a lot of people's uh, mind when they talk about research, we want to apply, uh, sorry, we want to improve the quality of our product. Therefore, again, tons of articles on the didactics of any language. Then, research may be as means for quality control, you know, and this goes beyond this, what usually people talk, when usually people talk about research, this is basically reaching out um, to academic research. And I think, I still believe that we are very different from, um, from the philologies, very different from the language departments, um, that we are excellent laboratories because we have conditions, laboratory conditions, uh, which schools don't have, which language departments uh, don't have, uh, where you have a variety of languages. In philologies, you have one language. Um, we have practical experience with different learning, learning biographies and 
And also we can, we are allowed to experiment, very, very different from the school context, where you're not allowed to experiment with things. Um, so I think we are actually uh, able, if we do it well, and I think um, how to do it well, uh, Dorothy will talk about later. Um, if we do it well, then of course we can provide new insights in, into a lot of things, and not necessarily only into the didactics of languages. There are lots of other topics, and I'll mention a few um, in a minute. Uh, again, the conditions. Um, I think it is very important. The second point I find very important. I think we have to get involved. We don't have to create our own debates. We have to get involved into, uh, in, into de in, in debates uh, that are at the moment pertinent in, in societies. And I'm sure there are lots of people who, who, who I mean, um, Nick's uh, project, the, the Cities project, for instance, is, is a bit like that. Move away from your immediate context and see what, how your immediate context relates to what's going on around uh, in, in the world. And I think that's, that's my idea of what you can do. Um, my question is, are there any interesting academic um, discourses to which language centers could contribute? And I'm sure there are. I think what we're noticing is, I mean, you'll see I'm moving away from, from things like how to teach vocabulary. Um, I think what we're experiencing, much more than, than the individual philologists, how much more than, much more than the linguists, on a daily basis, with students who come with their learning, new learning biographies, with their bilingualism, with, with their experience in different countries and different cultures, how much they all of a sudden start questioning their own identity, identity or identities. There's a big discussion going on at the moment about identity, about German identities and so on. Uh, with, with, with a move towards multilingualism and multiculturalism in Germany. And, um, and just recently in a debate, uh, the German Minister of the Interior actually argued that there is no such thing as multiple identities. The uh, question is, do we have experience and can we actually reflect on this experience and can we relate it to a public debate on the basis of, 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 of empirical data and, and of our um, our, uh, our exp experience backed up by, by empirical data. Attitudes to multilingualism. You hear that this is our daily business, right? English only is a question of attitudes to, to multilingualism. Um, multiling <laughs> that, that, that's again our business, multilingual communication institutions. How much can we actually contribute? Is it possible? Is it, we've had this in Volko. Volko is again was a laboratory for that. Because people speak, we, we, we try to, we experiment it with different language groups, um, and uh, we have people here whose English is, 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 is not C2, but they speak other languages uh, which we don't speak. So, what do we do in such a case? This is an experiment. If we reflect on it, if we report on it, then of course that's the kind of research people outside will probably look at. Language policy, again. Language biography, biographies and didactic changes. A big issue at the moment in the schools, in the schools, even in Brandenburg, around us. The question is now, all of a sudden, you get all the immigrant children, you get all the people who come from with um, asylum seekers, migrants, immigrants, refugees, and all that. We don't have the teachers for that because they have no experience. The teachers don't have any experience. So how much can we actually help the, the people there with, with our experience? So, to sum up, I think when we think about research and we tend to overlook questions, debates, public debates that are going on around us, where we have the expertise, but what we have to do is look at it more carefully with a research eye. Not every language center can do it. Not every language center has to do it. They can still do it a perfect job, much better than research institutions sometimes. Uh, but I think we should try and we should get together. And I think Vulko uh, would be a good way of, of setting up, um, looking at questions and setting up teams that could help us and that could also help sort of making the identity 
uh, of, of language centers and the function of language centers uh, much clearer than they are now. Um, so that's what I think. I think we should develop. And when I said heterogeneity of our teams could be a problem, it could also be an asset because we, then um, we could think about interdisciplinarity. But then people should not think, well, I'm, I've learned, I, I mean, I, I, my degree is in literature, so I want to continue actually doing, you have this parallel world sometimes. They, we have, I have colleagues who actually continue their career writing about literature and at the same time they teach. Why not bring the things together? I think that's the only thing, research I would, um, I would advocate uh, and, and I, would, I would like to see uh, in language centers. That's it. Thanks. <laughs>